We're looking at um, Jesus' garden prayer where he is aware aware that it's going to be the last evening of his earthly life. And he has been sitting um, with the disciples experiencing the Last Supper. And as we join them, the Last Supper is concluding. And what he says is that when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus and the disciples, it's about anywhere from depending on who you trust to understand where they were exactly. It's hard for us to know exactly where they were. Uh, probably it was a, a walking. It, it was anywhere between a half a mile to a mile to a mile and a quarter. And so they were walking to the Mount of Olives. Judas has already left to betray Jesus. He left earlier in the meal. And so the individuals who understand that Jesus will be going to the Mount of Olives, apparently they had that all planned out in advance, are already on their way to take Jesus into captivity. Um, And then Jesus, when they are en route, this is what he says to his disciples, and here's where we're going to look as he's walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, We'll think this morning about what happens before he gets there, his discussion with them. Here's what he says. Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. The word that we got to understand is the word fall away. He says, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. To fall away literally means, if you, want to, if you want to look at an image, to fall away is to be walking on a road and there's something in the way, you don't see it, and you stumble over it. So you stumble and fall. That's what he says. You're going to stumble and fall this very night. When we apply it to not walking from point A to point B, but to a relationship, what it is to fall away is to begin to distrust and desert one whom they ought to trust and obey. And what Jesus says, you're all going to do this. You're all going to desert and disobey me this very night. And the cause of the stumbling, Jesus indicates, and when he says to them what's going to happen, it doesn't seem like he's condemning them. He's not angry. He's just telling them a fact because Jesus is a shepherd and he understands what happens to the sheep when the shepherd is harmed. And if the shepherd is struck or attacked, the sheep will react accordingly. That's not that they're bad. It's just that they're sheep. And that's what sheep do when their shepherd comes into some type of harm. And that's what Jesus tells them. This very night, you will stumble. You will desert and disobey one whom you trust because the shepherd, The shepherd will be struck this evening. And the sheep, because the shepherd is struck, are going to be scattered. Jesus says this because he understands human nature. Let's think about Jesus. Um, There's a quote I really like. It's it's in the beginning of one of the... Anyways, it says, um, God's love for us is utterly realistic based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about us, so that no discovery can disillusion him about us in the way we are so often disillusioned about ourselves and quench the determination to bless us. Put, Put simply, God cannot be disillusioned about you. He cannot see you doing X and think, why are you doing X when I expect you to do you to do Y? The reason why God can never be disillusioned about you is that he's never illusioned about you in the first place. To be illusioned about someone would be to imagine that they were something other than they're not. God cannot be illusioned. Therefore, he cannot be disillusioned. And that's what Jesus says to them. They will distrust and desert the shepherd whom they ought to trust. Now, now Luke adds some embarrassing content. The gospel writers, they have a little bit of a different slant sometimes. And what Luke reveals to us about what's happening on that night, uh, the disciples are kind of being naughty. That's what we find out. Uh, It says in the same way, after the supper in Luke's account, 
He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So far, so good. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. And that's Judas. So Judas, pretty soon after this, makes his exit. Then look what happens. They begin to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. And Judas actually leaves, and they don't understand that he is leaving because he's the one. They think he just has to go to the bank. And so they're still arguing with one another about which of them is the one who is going to betray them. And then this turns into an argument about not which of them are going to betray him, but which of them is going to be considered to be the greatest, which is really not a shining moment. It's not when they have the, the, uh, the basketball thing, you know, the shining moment, the video. Uh, if this was, if they had a shining moment video thing of the Last Supper, this would not be one of the things where they're saying, no, I think I'm going to be the greatest. No, I think you're going to be the greatest. They're arguing who will have bragging rights. No, that some of them maybe were a little bit more subtle, but Peter is not very subtle. And so he feels like he needs to pipe up and, and he puts the everyone and he ends up saying things out loud that all of them are, well, look what he says. Peter replies, even if all fall away on account of you, and he looks around, <laughs> even if all these lunkheads fall away on account of you, I never will. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter says, no way. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. It's what I want us to understand is that they really did feel bulletproof. That, and I'm not, they did. They felt bulletproof when they assessed how they felt about Jesus, their loyalty to him. They felt that their emotion and their devotion were equal to any kind of thing that would happen to them. They could not imagine something happening that would cause them to do what Jesus tells them that they will do. They really can't imagine it. It just doesn't seem possible. They had walked with him for three years. They had experienced a lot of things. They don't understand something that they will understand in the matter of a few hours. Their confidence and ability to do and to follow are directly related to the fact that he's with them. They have no idea what's going to happen when he is removed from them and they're all alone, a bunch of sheep. And what Jesus, Jesus understands, they are going to scatter because their confidence is directly related to his presence with them. They, when they're with him, they feel a strength that comes from the fact that he is with them. Um, this has been a pattern, if you look in the Bible, people overestimating their devotion. There's a, another, and from the book of Hosea, they are in a place where they, they're not doing very well spiritually. And so they say, come, let us return to the Lord. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that watered the earth. They say, you know, what? we've kind of screwed up, but let's go to him. We're going to be fine. You know, we'll move towards him. And here's what God's reaction is. What can I do with you, Ephraim? That's the northern part of Israel, Ephraim. What can I do with you, Judah? That's the southern part. Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. You know what it's like on a, on a, on a foggy morning? You know, it's like 7 a.m. And, and it happens out here sometimes. You know, you can see the, the clouds settle in and it's misty and, and it looks real and you can't see. But then you think, boy, I wonder if this is going to burn off. But by 9 o'clock, it's burned off and everything's clear. It's the same thing for them. Their devotion feels real, but it's going to burn off in a couple of hours. That seems to, that's a kind of a pattern in the Bible. In this context, having just made this proclamation, I'll go with you to, to prison and to death, Jesus addresses Peter directly. 
Before Peter says, I will go with you both to prison and to death, before he says that, Jesus has a discussion with him, and here's what he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. We're going to go on, but I, just to make a just a, a passing comment, that actually is fairly significant. In one of the versions, it says Satan demanded permission. And the reason it says it's demanded, because the assumption is that Satan has the power to demand, but the word literally is asked. Satan does not have the ability to push God around. Whatever is the truth between God and Satan, it's not a fight. Again, I've said to this, I've illustrated this before. Let's say John, John back there is the king of a rival nation, and, and I'm going to go to battle with John. And so would you imagine, so if I'm going to battle to, with John, and, and I, 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 I call him on the phone, and I, I say, you know, John, if you know, yeah, yeah, John, if you could pick up, thanks a bunch. Um, you know what, John, I, I don't know if you're, if you're not too busy this afternoon, I'd like to, I'd like to, um, I'd like to shoot a few people and set off a few grenades, if, if, if it's not too much to ask. I'd, I'd like to go to war with you. Would that be okay? You know, not much of a battle, is it, if I have to ask permission. For whatever then the reason, Satan is on a short leash. He doesn't have the ability to do anything opposed to what God allows him to do. Now, that can be kind of confusing, but that's clearly what Jesus seems to indicate. Do you remember what happened with Job? Job and, and Satan then entered the courts of heaven, and he didn't, he didn't disguise himself, apparently. You know, I don't think he has horns and stuff like that. Anyways, he goes up and he joins the group that is meeting with God. And he, he doesn't go incognito. He says, by the way, you know, and God says, have you seen Job? Boy, he's a heck of a guy, isn't he? And, and Satan says, oh, yeah, but if you let me attack him, and then God allows it. And he asks permission. And then there came a time where, in later Judaism, it became more of a fight. So God and Satan appear to be enemies, and Satan is able to kind of poke God in the eye. Then Jesus comes along, and what is Jesus' estimation of God and Satan? That Satan has the ability to poke him in the eye, or is it more like Job? Jesus says the relationship is more like Job. Satan asked to sift you as wheat. Uh, you know what sifting is. I remember my mother, uh, she'd make pies, and it used to be, I guess I don't know if they do this anymore because flour is different. You know, it used to be that you used to sift, they sift the flour. You know, you remember that thing, that, that you know, the grade, and, and you do this, and then, the, and the, then the flour goes onto the wax paper, and then you throw away the crumbly things that are on the top of the screen and, and use the stuff. I'm not sure if we have to do that anymore. I don't bake many pies. <laughs> Anyways, you don't want me to bake any pies. Um, so at any rate, uh, what, what sifting is about, it's removing the usable from the unusable stuff. And what God did, he allowed Satan to do that. But you know the way it is when you sift, you know, the crumbly stuff, you don't take the wax paper and dump the wax paper in the in the garbage and then you know save the crumbly stuff you do the opposite you throw away the crumbly stuff and you save the stuff on the wax paper and what jesus ends up doing allows satan to sift peter but what jesus does then he throws away the crumbly stuff because there's crumbly stuff in peter the stuff that has to be removed lifted off and what jesus is going to allow is for Satan to do something to Peter that will allow Jesus to remove or would allow some of the things that stand in the way of Peter being as usable as um, Jesus would have him to be. Um, Satan is allowed to cause Peter to stumble for two reasons. Two reasons. Satan says, I want to make things difficult for Peter. And God says, yes, I think in fact it's God's idea. And he says, because of what it will do with Peter and because of what it will do with the world. 
And those two things, let's look at what it will do with Peter. First of all, why strike the shepherd and scatter the sheep? So that Peter is going to have to experience saying, I don't know him to a servant girl. Uh, there's two things that can happen, um, like two similar reactions. There's shame and humility. What's the difference between shame and humility? They're very similar in a way. Um, they have a different kind of universal sign. The universal sign for shame is this. You know, so if I'm ashamed, this is kind of the universal facial recognition for shame. What am I doing? I'm turning away from you. And the reason is, I don't want to see you looking at me because I'm aware, conscious of something that I've done that may be foolish or wrong, and I don't want to see the look on your face, and I don't want you to see the fact that I, I don't feel really good about what I've done. That seems to be what shame is about. Shame is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. Is this what Jesus wants to produce in Peter? Remember what it says later on? After Jesus denies that he knows a servant girl, remember what it says about Jesus? He's passing by at that point. And all it says, Jesus looked at Peter. That's a look I'd like to get. So Peter has just finished denying. Jesus is en route from point A to point B, and he looks at him. And he was disillusioned, right? <laughs> Can't believe it. <laughs> Not at all. He was never illusioned about Peter in the first place. The reason is he allowed this to happen and he just looked at him. Just looked at him. I don't think he was angry. I think he was saying, do you remember what I said to you, Peter? Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Do you remember that? I am not surprised by what I see happening. And that didn't help Peter. But at any rate, that's, that is what, that's shame. What's humility? Humility is, there's actually two words that are opposite. There's pride and humility. Pride means, is the Greek for pride is hubris. Hubris is up. It's high above. It's me over you. This is pride. It's up. And humility is the opposite. Humility is low. It's low. It's to descend. It's to bow or to be underneath. So with respect to those who reveal God, there are those who lord it over. That's arrogance. And that's what Jesus is wanting to remove from Peter. That's the crumbly stuff is arrogance. And what Jesus is going to allow Satan to do this so that Peter is going to be knocked down a few things. Now, humility is not this. Humility is this. Those who are greatest in the kingdom don't rise into greatness. They descend into it. In God's opinion, the great in the kingdom are those who descend into greatness. They're the humble. They're those who, well, they have a modest or low view of their own influence or importance. Humility is being chronically unable to use what you have to get what you want. It's the experience of, I can't have the life I want, I don't have the job I want, I don't have the emotions I want, I don't have the attitude I want. And it's the inability to use what you have to get what you want. What we end up doing when we can't get what we want, initially we blame someone. Well, I can't because I'm defective. I'm, I can't because you're defective. What ends up happening over time, if you are chronically exposed to the inability, it's almost like you lose energy to stop blaming. And you get to the place where I'm going to have to just accept the truth that I am not all that I thought I would be. This is a painful place to get to. But interestingly, if you are in a position where you're not able to, your desires are kind of frustrated. You're not able to use what you have to get what you want. You might think I've done something wrong and I can't be used. Actually, just the opposite is true. 
Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you're in a place where it's not going as well as you want it to, you might think, I can't be used. You know, the fact is exactly the opposite. You're, in, you're on the road to being used because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In fact, this is something Peter learned. This is Peter's letter. I want you to think about what you know, what we know about what happened to Peter that night. And this is what he wrote. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. There were a couple of people at the Last Supper that ended up not functioning very well. You know, there's Peter, and then there's the one that already left, and there's Judas. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? Actually, they had two very different outcomes. So it's about Judas. Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Would you call that shame or humility? You agree with me to call that shame, wouldn't you? I don't want anybody to see how defective I think I am. And that's shame. He killed himself. Why didn't Peter follow suit? Do you imagine, imagine how humiliated Peter was having made this huge profession, I'm going to go with you both to prison and to death. And a servant girl said, I know you, you were with them. And he said it, and he I don't. And then he, it says, then Jesus looked at him. And you know what Peter did? Peter shrunk a couple sizes. There is a little verse in the Bible that I think about it, and I just, I want to be there. I want to see this. Actually, it, here's what it says. Paul writes, I received what I passed on to you as the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Peter. <laughs> Would you like to be there at that discussion? I really would, because Peter walks out of that discussion still humbled, but not ashamed. You know why? Because Jesus reconnected. You know what the deal with shame is? Shame is very separate, isn't it? Very separate. Jesus didn't allow that to happen. He didn't allow Jesus to, Peter to separate. You know what he did? He went to him, and he eyeballed him. And what he communicated with him, Peter walked into and out of that as the rock. It really is true about us, by the way. Our strength is drawn by our connection with God. Now, again, we don't have the connection with God that we might like. But little by little, what I'm going to encourage us to do is develop an ongoing honesty with God. Don't be try to be all that with Him. Just be really open and honest with Him. What you're going to find over time, you'll develop more of a relationship and the sense of your connection. Now, all of us have a ways to go. We don't do the things we want to do. We don't think the things we want to think. We don't feel the things we want to feel, and we don't have the things we want to have, right? Anybody agree with me about that? And we might think, well, that's because I'm bad, and you're bad, and he's bad. And you know, the fact is, if you're going to be used by him, you are going to be put on a road that it's going to be obvious to you that you can't do, have, think, and feel what you want to do, have, think, and feel. And you're going to want to blame somebody. You know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to eyeball you. You know what he's going to say? Listen to me. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What do you want to be, usable or pretty? You want to be pretty, a pretty light, or do you want to be usable in my hands? If you're going to be usable, you're going to go through things, and you're going to get your nose bruised. You're going to deal with some difficult things, but it's not because, not because I don't love you. 
It's because I do, and I want you to be useful. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to and through the humble. Humility is not a fun thing. And by the way, if some of you tell me, okay, Mike, I'm going to pray for God to humble me, don't do it. <laughs> don't, because humility is really painful, very difficult, and it's not something that we ask for. But when we go through it, and we walk with other people, and we connect with God, we connect this way, and we connect with others. You know what, boy, man, I'm struggling. And if we get to the place where we can start to walk with other people, not doing this separating, if you're in a tough place, find somebody who won't point a bony finger at you and talk to them about it. Open up. Listen, man, I'm struggling. I just, everything seems to be kind of, twisting off. Find some, don't find a person who's going to be really religious and really big and point a finger. Don't, don't share that with them. If you've got somebody that seems to understand, talk to them. Don't go through it alone. Because Judas went through it alone, but Peter didn't. And Jesus doesn't want us to go through stuff alone. Um, God allowed Satan to sift Peter because this would accomplish God's purpose for Peter. Because God gives grace to the humble. God allowed Satan to sift Peter because it would also accomplish God's purpose for the world. Um, again, uh, Jesus told them this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus seems what stumbling will accomplish. Stumbling will produce humbling. And stumbling will also promote scattering. The word for scatter. So let's say if I kind of created a ruckus that got everybody scattering. And from this perspective, it would look like chaotic. Scattering looks chaotic. And that's what it would have looked like that night. That Jesus looks at Peter. And Peter then, and he runs away crying and the rest of the disciples huddle in an upper room and just hope nobody, hope nobody knows we're here. Because that very night they all were falling away. They were deserting and disobeying. And, um, and it's interesting that um, he said that that would happen and it looked chaotic, but from a divine perspective, you know what was happening? The word for scattering is exactly the same word for the word to sow seed. You know, I'm thinking, I'm getting to the place where maybe you want to rake up the front yard and, you know, you have to get all that and you rake it up and, you know, the thatch and then you put some seed. And so what you do is you have these crank things or you could, you know, the push things or you can just take it and do it like this. The word for scattering seed is the same word for scattered disciples. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, sown. And you know what the result is? They were sown and scattered into the Roman Empire. And guess we have the chance to be able to even talk about this because God struck the shepherd, the sheep were scattered, and they went to a place that ended up speaking our language. And that's what Jesus allows Peter to be humbled for, what it would do to Peter and what it would accomplish in the world that the world would know. That's what Jesus ends up saying. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. That's where the Gentiles were in Galilee. With a request, sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Peter, Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus didn't connect with a whole bunch of Gentiles, but Andrew and Peter, they did, and they go to Jesus and they said, Jesus, there's a bunch of Gentiles that, or at least there's some, there's a Gentile that wants to connect with you. And here's what Jesus replied. Okay, game time. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. You know the way it is with the seed? If you have one seed, like say a grass seed. Well, a grass seed is not the best example. Maybe a apple seed. In an apple seed, you got an apple seed, right? But if you if you dig a hole 
and put the apple seed in the hole and it creates a tree, what do you end up getting? How many seeds does a tree have? A bunch of seeds, right? There's in every, in every apple core, this seed. So there's one seed that goes into the ground, creates a bunch of seeds. Why did Jesus need to die? Because if he didn't die, we wouldn't be here. But when he dies, his body then, and the plant comes out, and the gift of eternal life can be shared with the world. That's why he does what he does. Striking the shepherd would cause the seed to be scattered and produce many seeds from God's point of view, from God's perspective. Um, there's a really kind of a, a twisty illustration. I'll, I'll say it real briefly and then we'll be done. Yeah, I've told you before, but there's a bamboo, there's a grove of bamboo shoots. And, and this one bamboo shoot is just hanging around. And these bamboo shoots can talk. I know I told you it's a really stupid illustration, but anyway, let's make the point. And so anyways, this bamboo shoot, there's a farmer that comes along and, and the bamboo shoot says to himself and says, you know, I'm kind of bored. I'd like to be used. And the farmer says, you want to be used? And the bamboo shoot said, yeah, yeah, I really do. And so then the, then the farmer takes out a machete. <laughs> the bamboo shoot says, wait, whoa. <laughs> he says, you want to be used, don't you? This is part of the process. He says, okay. So then he takes the machete and just hacks away at the base. Ow! Ow! And then that's done. Good. <laughs> I'm glad that's over. And then the farmer comes with a red-hot rod and plunges it into the middle of the bamboo shoot. Oh, God, that hurts. So you want to be used, don't you? Well, this is part of the process. And he hollows them out. Then he puts them in a, in, a, in a place where he dries out, and it's really hot. This is really hot. You want to be used, don't you? I do. And then, finally, they gathered up with all these other bamboo shoots that have been treated the same way. And one end is rammed into the opening of another bamboo shoot. Thing! Oh! And the other end is rammed into another end of a bamboo shoot. Thing! Oh! <sighs> I'm glad that's over. And then, so what are we doing here, by the way? These bamboo shoots can talk. Okay. Yeah, so there, it's on the side of a mountain. And this other bamboo shoot says, you see that? You see that mountain up there? That mountain has water. And you see that village down there? That village needs water. So we are the way that water from up there can be experienced by people down there. It seems to be in terms of God doesn't expose us to suffering to do things to us. God exposes us to suffering to do things through us, to make us usable. Because the deal is God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humbling is a hard process, but what it ends up in the end creates usefulness. Creates usefulness. Let's stand for closing prayer. God, we, it's, there's no fun in being humbled. It's, it's, it's hard. We blame and we, we think that there must be something wrong. And, and from your perspective, there's nothing wrong. You oppose the problem, give grace to the humble. Humility makes us useful. It's not pleasant. It's not fun. It wasn't fun for Peter. It wasn't fun for the disciples. But they had a more realistic estimation of themselves. And they ended up being useful because they connected with you in their humility. We're going through tough things, and we are. All of us. It's always true. I'd ask that little by little we'd be able to open up to others whom we can trust, not walk through it alone. Or, and, and, not or, and open up to you. Would you bring people along our path who would reflect you, that we could talk to about the things we're struggling with, so we don't have to walk through them alone? I think that's the deal. You don't want us to walk through that stuff alone. Help us find somebody that we could share with and help us little by little to learn to come toward you and be honest with you. Not to pretend, but to tell you how much it hurts, but also to ask for your help. Thanks for 
how good you are at allowing us to be used. In Jesus' name, amen.